If you uh, have your Bibles tonight, we are in Revelation chapter 19. And uh, tonight we're going to talk on this subject of the glorious return of Jesus. How many is looking for that? I'm looking for the rapture of the church, aren't you? I can't wait till Jesus comes and gets us and takes us home to be with him. And it gets more, it seems like, every day that you live in this life. That you look for him more every day. And uh, that you want to see him and as things go and as this old world goes anyway. Uh, nobody's going to be able to straighten it out but Jesus. And uh, so I can't wait for that day. Let's all stand tonight, and we're going to read there in verses 11 through verse 14. Now, we started this message last Wednesday, if you remember, but we only got through a little bit of the first part of that, and we're going to finish it, try to tonight, and I don't know that we'll get finished tonight. So uh, we'll just keep going, keep studying verse by verse. I like it like that, don't you? Verse by verse. And uh, we'll learn all we can from uh, these verses. Well, the Bible says there in verse 11 through uh, verse 14, And I saw the heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as flame of fire, on, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. Let's thank the Lord for the reading of his word. Father, we love you tonight and we thank you for your precious word. And Lord, we want to study together tonight. We want to be taught something and Father, I can't do that. I, I'm, just, I'm just imperfect, and, and Lord, you're the only perfect one. So we ask your help tonight. We ask, Father, that you will fill me with your spirit. Speak through me the very things you would have us to hear tonight. And Father, help us to never be the same because we've been taught the word of God. Help us to go out of this place sharpened so that we can witness to other people about you. And Father, thank you for what you're going to do here tonight. You're a good God. In your precious, sweet name, we pray these things. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, tell somebody you love them before you sit down there tonight. You know, uh, many years ago, back in the early 1900s, you know, things were moving along a little bit better and, and, and pretty good, you know, and people were progressing in uh, their lives, and they thought we were headed towards this utopia, is what they used to say about that. We had at this time, you know, an industrial revolution going on, and uh, we had the scientific, uh, scientific discoveries all around, and we had uh, the increase in social reform going on. There was just so many things that were going on that people thought that it was screaming uh, towards a better day ahead. But we found out that wasn't the fact. Even though we are one of the blessed, more blessed nations in this entire world, uh, when we turned our back on God, and I believe that we have turned our back on God, we are seeing some of the things that God said would happen to a nation uh, that would turn their back on him. One of the things is, he said they would be an increase in wars. Now, I know that we're not officially, you know, uh, somewhere that we are fighting right now, but we are in Afghanistan. We're fighting the war on terror right now. Uh, we're somewhere all over this world uh, fighting somewhere. 
North Korea, we're trying to make peace there. South Korea, we have men there. We have men in Germany. We have men everywhere. And women also. And so we have these wars. We also have this terrorism going on everywhere, especially in the United States. It's a senseless violence that is going on in our world today. Uh, we are seeing our policemen shot. Uh, we are seeing our public servants shot. We are seeing people going into churches and shooting people as they sit and worship the Lord. We are seeing all of this stuff going on tonight, right now, while we are living. These things are going on. We are seeing a total collapse in moral values. If you turn on the TV, you can watch it for five or ten minutes and something will be said to offend you. Because that's just the society that we live in tonight. And when you think about all of this, you have to understand there's only one solution. And I talked about that as the, at the first. I kind of got ahead of myself because I'm ready for him to come. Amen. I'm ready for Jesus to come and uh, take us out of the mess that we're in tonight. And uh, he is coming, folks. I think sometimes we forget that. I think sometimes we get so caught up in the things and the heartache and the, 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 the countless acts of uh, uh, moral values declining and the violence. And we get so caught up in these things that we forget that Jesus is coming. And one of these days, everything's going to be under his rule. It's not going to be under the rule of, uh, uh, mon, you know, of all of these other governments or the Antichrist or the devil. One of these days, everything is going to be under the rule of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says he's going to bring peace. And it'll be peace that we've never known on this earth. Peace that no one can even hardly imagine in their lives we are going to have. There's not going to be any more war one of these days. Now, I know that's hard to even imagine, isn't it? That no more war, that you won't turn on TV and hear of all these wars and these people being killed. You won't hear of that anymore because God's going to take care of that. And one of these days, God's going to bring injustice. And there's not going to be any more sin. Now, I know that's hard for us to believe because we see so much of this going on right now. We see so much sin, even in our own families. I mean, let's just be honest. Even in our own families, we've seen so much sin and the sickness that comes from sin. We, we see it one of these days, God's going to get rid of all that. Jesus is going to get rid of all that. So, looking into these events, I want to start with this passage again, and I've divided it into four sections that I want to look at tonight, and we looked at a little bit of this last week, but I want to look at the rest of it tonight. Let's talk just for a moment about the return of the conqueror. Now, we found that in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 13. Of course, we just read that. We're not going to read it again, but when we read that we will see that the times come now for this glorious revelation of the sovereign Lord they are going to see him this world is going to see him the sovereign Lord the one that flung the stars in the sky the one that speaks to our heart through the Holy Spirit the one that created the heavens and the earth one of these days we're going to see him face to face now, I don't know how that makes you feel, but it makes me feel like, man, I, I, I can't wait to see him. I can't wait to bow down before him. So as this scene unfolds, John stands there in verses 11 through 14. He's transfixed. He's riveted. He's riveted on this majestic, this regal, this mighty rider of this white horse. And we read that just a few minutes ago. He, he can't get over how beautiful he is and, 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 and what it really means, this white horse, and, and what it means for him to be on this white horse. It means that Jesus is getting ready to come and receive his kingdom. That he's getting ready to come and the, as the promise of the Father had been given to him, that he's going to take back this earth. 
How many of you know that no longer is Jesus going to be portrayed here as he was in humiliation when he first came? He's going to be, he's going to, you know, in his first coming he was humbled and mounted on a donkey, but now he's going to ride this traditional white horse which symbolizes a spotless, unblemished, absolute, holy character. That's who he's going to be on this white horse. We're going to see him one of these days. What a beautiful, beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ this is. And because he's been faithful to his word and, and his righteous character is here shown, it follows that his righteousness he will judge. He's the only one that can judge right. And the reason that he's the only one that can judge right tonight is he's the only one that can look into your heart and know who you are. Amen. Now you can fool a lot of people. I mean, you can fool your wife, you can fool your kids, you can, you can fool your family, you can fool this. But folks, we cannot. Now, listen to me tonight. We cannot ever fool Christ. Ever. Because He knows our hearts tonight. He knows exactly who I am. And He knows when I got saved. He knows if I am saved. He knows if I'm His child. He knows all of this. And tonight, He knows that about you. And I ask you, does He know that you're a Christian? Does He know that you love Him? Because He deserves that. And one day, if, he, if you're just trying to fool everybody else, you won't fool Him. I'm just telling you that. There's no fooling Him. No longer will He be the suffering servant of His incarnation. Lord Jesus Christ in this vision is seen as the King who wages war against His foes. So John writes about this. He says, first of all, He rages war. And the Bible says in verse 12, His eyes were as flames of fire. What does that mean? His eyes. When He saw Him. Now John's looking at Him. And John's seeing him on this horse, on this white horse. He's getting ready to come and end this thing here on earth. He's getting ready to come and finish this thing here on earth. And the Bible says his eyes were as flames. That's judgment. He looks through all of the stuff. And his judgment is there. He can see everything. The Bible says his eyes were as flames of fire. Nothing, nothing in this life or out of this life escapes the notice of his penetrating, piercing vision. He can see everything. He can go down into the deepest recesses of the human heart. He can go down to the deepest, darkest places of our lives. And he can lay bare everything that we are with him. Because he's the only one that can see us. In his eyes, in the eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ, are reflected tenderness and joy, by the way. He's not just the judge. He's a tender God. He loves us. He's tender towards his people. He's tender towards his children. I want you to know tonight when you hurt, he knows you're hurting. I want you to know tonight when you need him, he knows exactly what you need. He knows exactly who we are and what we need. When He looks at us with those tender eyes of joy, He gathers. It's the same God that gathers the little children to Himself. You see, here they had reflected compassion when He observed the distress and the, 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 the spirited people as they wandered like sheep without a shepherd. In the Bible, he, he loved people. He, he always wanted to help people. The Bible says Jesus wept, shortest verse in the Bible, because the people didn't want to accept him, didn't want to even know who he really was. And the Bible says he wept about that. He, he weeps about, I believe sometimes when he was, you know, I believe sometimes our heart breaks his heart. How about you? I believe that. I believe that sometimes we just break the heart of God. I'm so glad tonight that I'm not a sheep without a shepherd. I'm so glad tonight that he comes after the little lost lamb, aren't you? 
And I was one of them one day, and he came and got me and brought me into his foe. His eyes also reflect forgiveness. You say, what do you mean? Well, when he resorted, to, when, when he resorted and he told Peter, he, he restored Peter back to himself because Peter was crushed by guilt. Why? Why was Peter crushed by guilt? Because he denied Christ. Three times he did that, yes. He denied him. But Jesus' eyes still loved him and still knew his heart. And still knew that he was his child. Isn't that good? You see, we want to preach on Peter about him denying the Lord. But we never really want to preach a lot about how Jesus forgave him for denying him. Because why? Because he loved him. Just like he loves you. And just like he loves me. You see, folks, a lot of times we preach so much about the judgment. And I'm going to get into the judgment tonight. We preach so much about the judgment of Christ, and that's all we preach is the judgment. We forget to preach on the loving care of Christ. How He loves us. And He cares for us. It's the same God that forgave Peter and brought him back into the fold because he had denied him. It's the same God here in this verse as we see him on this white horse. It's the same God where his eyes wept over the fate of unrepentant Jerusalem, as I said just a minute ago. He, he wept over the sorrow and the suffering of this sin-cursed world. He hates sin. I don't know where we get off to think that we can sin and just keep on sinning and God... And we say to ourselves, well, God understands. He don't understand. Because God sent His precious Son to die for our sins on a cross. It took the death of Jesus for our sins. Does everybody understand that? It took His death. It's a serious thing, this sin issue. So don't belittle sin. Don't say when people say to you, you know, let's talk about your sin. Let's, let, let's try to get your sin under the blood of Jesus. Don't say about people that try to help you, my sin is my own sin. Listen, folks, your sin affects a lot of people. Always has and always will. But here, what does John see? He doesn't see Jesus that his eyes are weeping over Jerusalem. He doesn't see the Jesus that restored Peter here. Who does he see? Well, the Bible says he sees Jesus that his eyes are flashing with fire. That's who he sees. Also in verse 12, it says this about this Jesus. It says, on his head were many crowns. Now that word crown there is, uh, is uh, broken down into this word, and it's a very important word. It's translated to diadem, the word diadem. And that means victor's crown. So many crowns here is what it's talking about. Well, that crown there is a diadem, victor's crown. He has many victor's crowns upon his head. What does that mean, preacher? Well... These are shown, worn by Jesus to reflect his royalty. I think sometimes we forget how royal he is in his majesty. Can I tell you tonight, he is, and it's going to say it here in a minute, we're going to preach on it. He is the king of kings and lord of lords. His royalty. And the Bible is going to reflect that when it says on his head were many victors' crowns. They're shown war by Jesus here, reflecting his royalty. I want you to remember tonight, this, uh, remember this, that any time a king would conquer an opposing force, he would wear that kingdom's crown. So tonight, what it says about Jesus is it says that he is wearing many crowns. Christ alone is the only sovereign. It's putting him as the only one now. It's saying about him, he is the only king. And I don't care what this world says. I don't care what 
our past presidents have said. There is only one Lord. His name is Jesus. Amen? I mean, folks, we get so mixed up sometimes because people talk about this and talk about that. Jesus is telling you right here, He's the only one. He's the only one that can wear these crowns. Matter of fact, the Bible says in Revelation eleven fifteen, we'll go back there for this, uh, for, uh, for this because it says here, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of His Christ, and He shall reign forever and ever. It's just showing you in the distance now that He's doing that. That He's going to reign as the only king of this place. Jesus is going to take all the crowns of the entire earth to himself. He's going to take them. He's going to wear them. He's going to be the only king. Verse 13 says this. Here's another feature about this judgment that is coming from our Lord that is setting on the white horse. One thing is that uh, his eyes reflect flames. The second thing is, verse 12, on his head were many crowns. And the third thing is, and his clothes... Uh, and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. That's the third thing that John notices about him. Now, I want you to understand here, this blood is not representative of that that he shed on the cross. That's not what it's talking about here. But how many of you know he did die for our sins? How many of you know his blood does save us? His blood cleanses us from all of our unrighteousness. But this is not talking about that blood that was shed on the cross. What this is talking about, this is talking about the picture of the blood of judgment. It's not redemption here. This blood is the blood of His slaughtered enemies. And Jesus will slaughter His enemies one day. In a moment of time, in just a, a, a word of time, just a, a spoken word, and they will all die. He will slaughter them all. That's what it means. Our God is so powerful that He will slaughter all of His enemies. The second thing I want you to notice tonight is the army of the conquerors. We've seen the return of the conqueror, but the army... Of the conqueror. It's found in Revelation 19 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses. Now that's, a, that's an interesting phrase there, isn't it? The Bible says that, now read it with me one more time. The armies, that, so there's an army that's coming, and where were they at? In heaven, and they followed him, and who is him? Jesus, and he's on what? White horses. So he's on one, and the army's on one. That's a big army. So who does this army consist of, preacher? Who does this army, who's in this army that's in heaven? Well, we know the church is in heaven. After chapter 3, we know the church is in heaven. Amen. Through the rapture of the church, we believe in the rapture. We believe Jesus is going to take us home. So it's, 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 the, it's us, the raptured church. So I believe the first one that will be with the Lord Jesus Christ, these four divisions that will make up these glorified army of, of God, the first one is the bride of the Lamb. That's the church. That's us. Amen. You're the bride if you're saved tonight. If you're saved, say amen. amen. The church. And we're pictured, if you remember, we're pictured in heaven wearing fine linen, white and clean. We've been cleaned. We've been washed in the blood of the Lamb. We've been saved. We're in heaven with Jesus. Amen? The second part that's coming in this army is the tribulation believers. Those who are also pictured in heaven wearing white robes, the tribulation believers. There will be people saved during tribulation. How many understand that? Now, they will be. And, and there will be tribulation believers that will come with Jesus in this army. And then thirdly, there's the Old Testament saints Amen. that will be raised in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye at the rapture. Amen? And they'll go up to meet God in the air. 
That's what the Bible says. That these raptured saints will be with him in this army. And the fourth one is the holy angels of God. And by the way, folks, you don't want to mess with some angels. I mean, they don't have to do anything now. Because Jesus is going to take care of this. It's just the parade. It's just a magnificent... I mean, can you imagine John looking up and seeing all this? Can you imagine what he's seeing with Jesus on this horse and the, uh, the, the saints of God on theirs and, and, and the raptured saints and, and the tribulation saints and the angels of God? And here they come, and they're coming towards Armageddon. And you would think God would use everybody to fight, but he don't have to. He just says the word and everybody's dead. You say, you believe God's that powerful. I believe he's more powerful than that. That's the truth. Man, this is getting exciting now. And this is us. We're with Jesus. We're going to see all of this. One of these days you're going to say, well, that preacher, what he preached right there was right. That, that's exactly what that is right. You know why I know it's right? It's in the Bible. <laughs> it's right there. We're going to be with him. Victory. You see, the reason we always say as Christians we, we, we have victory because I've read the end of the book. That's the reason why. The end of the book tells us. All through the book tells us that we have victory. Man, hallelujah. You see, the army's not going to be used, but it's just pageantry. It's just, it's just the beautiful army of God. He alone will destroy his enemies. The saints will come not to fight, but to reign with Jesus. Troy, we're going to reign with him one day. You say, well, what will I do in his kingdom? I don't know. I know there's something for you to do. Yeah. Amen? Amen? God, I mean, we're not... Somebody said, well, preacher, are we just going to be up there and on, on, we're just going to sit on clouds and play harps? And, oh. No, no, come on. God has something for us to do. He's got a job. He's got a job for us to do. You know, I've seen some people that I think I might know what their job might be. You know, I've seen people that love children like I've never seen before. I mean, I, I've seen people that just love children. That's their gift, to love children. And how many of you know there'll be children in heaven? I mean, you know, that'll go through the tribulation and go to heaven. There'll be children. Until they grow up, you know, I, I think the, the thousand year millennial reign. Amen? Now we're getting a little deep. I got I to gotta back off. The thousand year millennial reign, they'll be taking care of children. I believe there'll be people who take care of flowers, God's flowers. How they love flowers. I, I believe there'll be people doing all kinds of stuff. I mean, it's just going to be a wonderful place. A new heaven and a new earth. How big is it going to be? It's going to be bigger than anything you've ever seen. I mean, we can, I, I, it's just going to be amazing how great it's going to be when we get to heaven. Well, I've got to get to the third thing. Everybody ready? The third thing, the rule of the conqueror. I want you to look now in verses 15 and 16. The rule of the conqueror. We've talked about the return of the conqueror. We've talked about the army of the conqueror. Now let's look at the rule of the conqueror. Verses 15 through 16. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he that he treadeth the winepress of his fierceness and wrath of Almighty God, and he hath on his vesture... And on his thigh, name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Now, the rule of this king is described in graphic, powerful imagery here. And I want you to understand it. John notes, first of all, a sharp sword coming out of his mouth. Now, I wish I had a... That picture really doesn't show anything there. There are pictures to where you can see that. Now, what does that mean, preacher, when it talks about... This sharp sword coming out of his mouth. Well, the apostle had seen that sword in an earlier vision in Revelation 1.16. 
And the reason it was there then and was used then was to defend the church. It was there to defend the church against the onslaught uh, of Satan's forces. It's the Word of God. Everybody with me? The Word of God is used... Listen, the Word of God better be used and always be used to fight your fight that you have with Satan. Because you've got to fight with Satan tonight. Everybody understand that? You better get in the Word and get you some Scripture to fight Satan. Because if you don't, he's going to black your eye. He'll knock you out, really. You've got to have the Word to fight Satan. The Word is the only thing that fights Satan and beats Satan. So... Here, in this scripture though, it is the sword of judgment. It's a flaming sword dealing with death. That's what it's talking about here. When you see this sword in chapter 19, this sword that comes out of his mouth, it is a symbol of death. Death is coming. Death from his mouth symbolizes the deadly power of Christ's words. The Word of God that says He came to die for the sins of the world. The Word of God that says you have to accept Him to be saved and go to heaven. All of these things God will use to judge humanity for their sins. And it comes out like a sharp sword of flames. God uses His Word to judge when you think of this as the sword coming from his mouth symbolizing the deadly power of Christ's words, once he spoke words of comfort, but now he speaks words of wrath. It's his wrath now that is coming upon the world. These armies that we're in, that we'll be in as the church, as the, uh, the church uh, represented in this army, will accompany Christ, but we'll carry no weapons. There'll be no weapons that will carry. The resurrected saints will not carry any weapons. The angels will not carry any weapons. None of us will carry any weapons. We'll have a white horse, but we won't carry any weapons. Why? Because God will take care of the enemies. Jesus will do it. He don't need us. We're just there as pageantry for it. He alone will weld the sword with which He will slay the wicked. He will do it in a moment of time. The slaughter will be instantly. I mean, that fast, the slaughter at the battle of Armageddon. The Bible says that he will return and he will rule with a rod of iron. He also said and promised that we would rule and reign with him in his new kingdom. Now when John talks about this rule, he says in verse 15, listen, And he shall rule them with a rod of iron, and he treadeth the winepress of his fierceness and the wrath of Almighty. The vivid symbol of God's wrath here is it comes from an ancient practice of stomping grapes. Now I know y'all have seen this, and I'm not trying to be funny, but you remember when Lucille Ball was in that vat of grape and she was... Well, but well, honestly, that's, that's the picture here. The stomping of grapes to make wine. They were stomping. Every time they would stomp, now get the picture. They're in this vat, this big vat of the old, you know, time, uh, you know, the way they did it. And, this big, and every time they would step on it, the wine juice, the grape juice would go up on the side of that vat and it would just splatter on it. And that's the picture God has given here of killing people. As he stomps out the life of these people, their blood will splatter just like the grapes. I know that's a horrible picture, but it's the truth, folks. That's what God is talking about here. It, it, it's the truth. He treadeth the winepress of his fierceness and wrath of the Almighty, the splattering of the grape juice pictures the pouring out of the blood of these enemies. The image of the wine press. It also shows us how the Old Testament uh, would tell us about the wine press. It's found in Isaiah 63, verses 1 through 3. I've got to hurry. This will be the last we can do right here. It says in Isaiah 63, 1 through 3, Who is this that com cometh from Edom? 
with dyed garments. This is picturing what God is talking about here. With dyed garments from Basra. This that is glorious in his apparel. Traveling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? And thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat. I have trodden the winepress alone. And of the people there was none with me. For I will tread them in my, mine anger. And trample them in my fury. And their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments. And I will stain all my raiment. That's a final look at the returning king. John saw in his vision that Christ wore a banner in verse 16. And here's what the banner said. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written. What is that name? How many believe that tonight? Amen. Hallelujah. Isn't that going to be something to see that one day? You say, preacher, is this real? Is that, is that what's going to happen? Is that the way it's going to be? I'm here to tell you, folks, we can picture it in our mind if we'd only pictured it. King of kings and Lord of lords forevermore. For 180 miles in that battle of Armageddon, for 180 miles, the blood will flow to the horse's bridle. And God will do it in a second of time. He'll wipe out hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, in a word of time. That's a powerful God. Amen. Lord Jesus, we love you. We thank you, Father, for the way that you love us. We thank you for warning us and giving us the word of God so that we can live our lives. And Lord, just like tonight, this scripture is so that we can be a witness, Father, to those that are lost. Lord, we're not preach anything that's not in the word it's right there father if we'd only read it and study it but lord sometimes we are that only link to the lost world christian folks and i'm so glad tonight that you have us in your house learning your word so that we can tell others about jesus so that we can be a witness so that they won't have to go through this so no one has to die and go to hell father help us to be that witness you may be here tonight and you've never been saved. Or you may be here tonight and you're praying for somebody to be saved. I don't know what your prayer is about tonight, but God does. And I'm going to ask you, why don't you just make it right tonight, whatever it is. Maybe you need to be a witness to somebody you haven't been. Maybe you need courage. Whatever it is tonight, will you come?